She could not prevail on them to change their purpose and embarked on an English sloop of war which had entered the Gironde. At Toulouse, General de la Borde caused Monsieur de Vitrolles to be arrested and he was conducted to Paris. The Emperor sent General Grouchy to take the command of the truce in the environs of Lyon. The general reinforced them with the National Guards of the neighboring departments and marched against the Duke d'Angoulême. He came up with the Duke, dispersed his troops, and made him prisoner. The emperor, who did not wish to abuse the favors of fortune, allowed the Duke to retire whither he thought fit. He passed into Spain. The Duke of Bourbon had been sent by the king to La Vendée. He was even accompanied by Count de Sessac, who had so well perfected the execution of the system of conscription under the emperor. The object of the Duke of Bourbon's journey was to raise an army in La Vendée, but when he learned the real state of things, as well as in the south, he adopted the resolution of embarking for England. All who had accompanied him returned to Paris to proffer their submission to the emperor. This was the moment when all France went might be regarded as united under the same banners. Unfortunately, it was not so long. Although the emperor's return had excited as much enthusiasm as wonder, it was nevertheless remarked that the triumph of modern over ancient ideas had a very great share in producing this effect. That such was the case was soon perceived by the cries for constitution, which are heard on all sides. The emperor was like, he was preferred to any other sovereign, but there was no disposition to listen to any modification of the limits within which it was resolved to confine his power, and the people would have proceeded to extremities had they not hoped that he himself would restrict his authority so as to afford perfect security against the return of the evils of which they had so fresh a recollection. In a word, it appears that he is accepted only as a lever which had displaced the house of Bourbon. It was wished to make use of him in case of war, but it was intended to keep the bridle on him in every other respect. Chapter 2. The individuals of the royalist party who remained in Paris observed the tendency of the public mind. They encouraged it because in causing constitutional principles to triumph, they added to the security of the situation by protecting themselves against inquiries which might have been made into their conduct. Fouché, who had other designs, had still better observed the bent of public opinion. He already knew the course he was to take on the return of the emperor. He had sent to Vienna to ascertain what was the intention there, suspecting that some agent must have been sent from that capital to the island of Elba to arrange with the emperor and to advise him. Respecting his enterprise, the same idea prevailed at Vienna, from whence the letter was sent to Fouché requesting explanations as to what could have brought about the emperor's return. He was informed that the determination which had taken not to recognize the emperor was in no respect changed, but that any other government that France might wish for would be granted, were it even the Republic. This letter, written by the Austrian minister, was brought to Paris by a young merchant of Vienna, who, not knowing how to get it from Fouché, applied to some persons who soon relieved him from his difficulty. Metternich requested the Duke of Otranto to send a messenger to bow and to furnish him with the tokens of recognition which the young merchant would communicate to him. These private signs would serve to introduce Fouché's messenger to an Austrian agent who was already at ball for the purpose of entering into more detailed explanations. The endeavors which the young merchant had made to find out Fouché became known. The emperor was informed of them. He caused him to be sought after and interrogated him himself. The young man concealed nothing. He mentioned the day in which he delivered the letter of which he was to be referred to Fouché. The emperor astonished that Fouché had not spoken to him on the subject, began to entertain suspicions. He judged, however, that there would be time to interpose some trusty person between Fouché and the Austrian agent. Consequently, he imparted to a confidential officer the signs of communication brought by the German merchant, and he added particular instructions for the execution of which he invested him with very extensive powers and took measures to intercept any agent whom Fouché might have sent to bow, as his arrival at his destination would have made the project miscarry. This plan succeeded completely. The emperor's agent presented himself to Metternich's emissary, who, not suspecting the snare, frankly declared the whole object of his mission. The emperor, after dispatching his agent, sent 
for Fouché. Several days had already elapsed since he received the letter brought by Metternich's messenger from Vienna, and yet he had never mentioned the circumstance. The emperor first put some indifferent questions to him, and then leading the conversation to the subject of public affairs, he gave Fouché to understand that he had heard some unfavorable reports respecting him, and that if they had any foundation, it would be much more honorable in him to retire at once from a situation which did not perhaps suit him than to act unfaithfully towards the party whom he professed to serve. If you have scruples, said he, resign. Fouché affected not to understand what the emperor meant. He knew that the young negotiator from Vienna had been arrested by the police. Nevertheless, he tried to waive the subject and feign to ascribe the emperor's apprehensions to malicious reports and intrigue. He did not, however, blind himself as to the consequences. He knew too well the sovereign he had to deal with to suppose that his treason would be forgotten. Henceforward, he applied to himself to repress the national spirit which it was desirable to rouse and to thwart by every means in his power the emperor's success it would have been the right course perhaps to have brought him to trial and to have punished him at once for all the perfidious actions he had committed during the last five and twenty years but the state of public affairs was at the moment too serious to admit of engaging in such a proceeding and besides it was thought advisable to await the return of the agent who had been dispatched to Baal in order to learn the nature of the communications which Fouché had opened there. This agent at length returned after completely deceiving the Vienna emissary and inducing him to give a full and detailed explanation of everything which was expected to be accomplished by the assistance of Fouché. It was proposed to betray the emperor. Everything would be readily settled providing that prince was delivered up and there appeared to be no individual in France so capable as Fouché to execute the enterprise. When the emperor saw this correspondence involved no plot against his life, he looked upon the matter as a mere piece of entry, and he had such an opinion of the clearness and rectitude of Fouché's mind as to believe that he himself would at once be convinced that such propositions, independently of their infamous character, evidently proved that the Allies were not so confident of success as their partisans represented them to be. It appeared, therefore, that it was only necessary to oppose them with courage. He believed even that when Fouché came to look at the business in a proper light, he would see that he might be able to induce them to deviate from a policy which was not the policy of all the powers by threatening to divulge overtures, the first consequence of which would be to make the whole nation fly to arms. There certainly were many advantages which might have been derived from the propositions the emperor's agent had brought from Bao. The emperor lost no time in coming to an explanation with Fouché. He was the more readily induced to do so because his agent before he left Bao had prevailed on the Austrian agent to agree to wait for him by promising that he would return with all speed and bring a positive answer. Fouché, thus taken by surprise, was obliged to give the emperor's agent a letter for the Austrian emissary. The letter was, however, couched in terms so equivocal that nothing could be drawn from it except that the bearer was in reality the agent of Fouché. This was all that was necessary, the bearer being clever enough for all else that was requisite. It was agreed that he should make the dread of arrest the excuse for the ambiguity of Fouché's letter, and that circumstance would entitle him to still greater confidence. The second message was no less successful than the first. The Empress Asian went and returned even a third time, but the Austrian who had gone to Vienna did not keep his appointment on the last occasion. What was the reason of this? Was it because the campaign was about to open, or was it because Fouché had found means to advise him of that trick by way of Baal or Vienna or by Brussels, where he was in communication with the Duke of Wellington? <laughs> I profess not to know the emperor's first impulse was to order Fouché's arrest. He altered his resolution, however, from the reflection that there would be time enough when he was more firmly established and that should such an adjustment of his affairs not take place, the punishment of Fouché would be a useless act of severity. Since his arrival in Paris, he had availed himself of every resource for reconstituting the army, which had suffered considerable reductions. The declaration the Allies could not fail of being quickly followed by hostile movements and the forces 
with which they menaced us, were vastly more numerous than any we could bring into the field to oppose them. The opinion was universal that inasmuch as the emperor had been overcome at a time when he was at the head of a greater number of troops than he could now possibly bring together, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for him to obtain any advantage. This idea was a source of uneasiness, but hope was still retained. Generally speaking, the emperor's return gave great satisfaction because under his government, every individual could look forward to public employment, whereas under the Bourbons, all offices had become the property of a few families, as was the case before the revolution of 1789. Thus, the success of the emperor was sincerely wished, but nobody could be blind to the difficulties he had to encounter. The emperor replaced on the army list all the men who had been dismissed. Troops were assembled, clothed, and equipped with an astonishing activity, but too many things were to do at once, and there was too little time to do them. Besides, it became necessary to order on ministerial authority the execution of measures which ought to have previously received the sanction of the legislative body, which was not yet assembled. The Office for the Affairs of the Interior had likewise a vast deal of business to transact, among other things. The votes of the communes for the emperor's re-election and the preparatory measures for assembling the Champ de May occupied the attention of that department. The minister of the police bestirred himself too, but as his influence was exerted only among men formerly distinguished for the violence of their principles, he worked as much against the emperor as against the House of Bourbon. Fouché's only care was to place himself in an attitude which would render him necessary to the government which might succeed the emperor, whatever that government might be. With that view, he suggested that the idea of departmental federations according to the practice of the first years of the revolution. In some instances, these federations succeeded, but a series of accidents occurred to doubt the ardor at first displayed and to hasten their dissolution. The emperor, seeing the necessity of again appealing to arms, ordered all the troops to be assembled at Flanders. He left but a few regiments in the south. He formed a corps at Lyon, which he placed under the orders of Marshal Suchet. There was another under the command of General the curve in the environs of before and a third of Strasbourg under General Rapp. General Gerard collected a fourth troop at Metz while the remainder of the army forming the principal mass assembled at Lille and at Valenciennes. This preliminary distribution of the only forces which after all her triumphs still remained in France obliged the emperor to withdraw from the western departments and regiments which had been stationed there. They were no sooner removed than an insurrection broke out and partially paralyzed a resource in which success mainly depended, namely the levies of men which were by this event interrupted in that quarter. But this was not all the evil. It was necessary to detach troops from the army to stop the progress of the revolt. This unlooked-for affair occurred at a very unfortunate juncture. While the elections for the legislative body were in progress, it produced no change in public opinion, but it increased the embarrassments of the government. The emperor was not a little vexed at the occurrence of this sort of new civil war. He directed that military operations should be rigorously prosecuted and that, at the same time, communications should be open with their principal Vendean chiefs, who were found not to be inaccessible to the propositions made to them, especially after La Roche Jacqueline, who headed the insurrection on the left of the Loire, had fallen. La Roche Jacqueline was the instigator of the civil troubles in La Vendée. He went to England to solicit arms and ammunition, and he had succeeded in obtaining both. On his return with this supply, his partisans took courage, but he soon fell a victim to his enterprise in an affair on the coast after he had received a second cargo of arms. He was struck by a musket shot, which stretched him lifeless on this shore. His successor was a man of less determined character. He accepted the terms offered by the Minister of Police, and the work of pacification was advancing when new events arose again to fix the destinies of France. The king of Naples, after he had abandoned his alliance with France, began to perceive, though a little too late, that he had been the dupe of the promises on which he had relied. He had been informed that at the Congress of Vienna, his as well as the emperor's destruction was contemplated. Accordingly, he had for some time back been 
taking measures for his own security and had spared no effort to create a numerous army, he had thus far succeeded when he heard of the emperor's departure from Elba, an event which he conceived afforded him a suitable opportunity for carrying his design into execution. He now perceived that there was no safety for him except by alliance with France, and that had he made but one year sooner the efforts he was then making he might with the aid of the viceroy's army have produced a diversion the advantage of which he would have experienced but at the period when he attempted the conquest of Italy, there was no more chance of success for him than there existed in favor of the Viceroy when he was placed under the necessity of attacking the United Austrian and Neapolitan armies. When the Emperor arrived at Paris, the King in April said he found the favorable moment for his mediated, meditated attack on Italy which he knew was teeming with discontent. He reckoned on an insurrection, which he expected would be the immediate result of his appearance, and he believed that he would thus give so much employment to the Austrian army that the emperor would have sufficient leisure and opportunity to make his way be again felt in the affairs of Europe. The limited nature of his understanding did not permit him to perceive that by... <laughs> Attacking Austria, he would probably prevent a reconciliation between the emperor and that power if any disposition to approximation existed on the part of Austria. But this was what Murat could not comprehend. Full of the idea he had cherished, the king and April advanced into Italy. The emperor viewed with displeasure this imprudent step, and being aware of the rash, wavering character of Murat, dispatched General Belliard in all haste with instructions for his guidance. Belliard embarked at Toulon in a frigate which conveyed him to Naples, but all was lost before he got there. The king of Naples, placing himself at the head of his army, advanced at the velocity of a rocket to the Po, and was there extinguished on the banks of that river he came up with the enemy who after several unsuccessful engagements on his part obliged him to retreat the Austrians pursued him and managed so well that all his troops disbanded such was the extent of the disaster that on the day General Villiard joined him he was deserted by 18,000 men fate had pronounced his doom he returned to Naples in order to embark for France the queen remained in that capital with her children and having secured by negotiation a retreat for herself and her family they took refuge on board of an English frigate the country thus deserted received the conquerors in the usual way and with them such government as they chose to establish general billiard was very fortunate in being able to embark and make good his return to paris and with the sad intelligence the emperor had not yet set up to place himself at the head of the army which was destined to act in flanders had the king of Naples deferred the commencement of his campaign, but for six weeks he might have been reinforced on the Po by the troops Marshal Suchet was collecting at Lyon. The appearance of this corps would, without doubt, have brought about the defection of the Piedmontese army. The position of the king of Naples would have been commanding, and Italy would have declared for him, had all hope of making terms with Austria failed, he still could have left his fortune to the chance of arms. And then the great problem involved in the return of Napoleon might have obtained a very different solution from that which it experienced. The destruction of the army of the King of Naples rendered it necessary for the emperor to leave Marshal Suchet in Savoy to guard the passes of the Alps. His force was not, however, strong enough, and he could no longer defend them. When, after occupying Naples, the Austrians appeared on those mountains. In the meantime, the king of Naples arrived at Frugius and, taking up his abode in a small maritime town on the coast of Provence, awaited the course of events. The agent whom Fouché had dispatched to Vienna to open a correspondence with Monsieur Talleyrand and Monsieur Dalberg had now returned. The account he gave Fouché of the resolutions adopted by the Allied sovereigns determined him as to the steps he should take. He thenceforward applied himself more to serve their designs than the interests of the emperor. I am persuaded that the offer of the allies to agree to any form of government wished for by France, if Napoleon were discarded, was made to Fouché for the sole purpose of inducing him to betray the emperor. That minister, whose ability was so much vaunted, fell into the snare. His vanity, his vanity was so flattered by the importance attributed to him that he could not perceive the motive of such adulation. He was perfectly satisfied that he was able to direct the allied sovereign as he pleased. But they, when they had no further need of him, cast him off with that ceremony. Monsieur de Talleyrand took care to send to Paris from time to time individuals belonging to the Department of Foreign Affairs who made it their business to 
confirmed Fouché, in notions he had adopted. I once observed with him a person who I believe was one of these agents and whom I afterwards saw acting zealously against the emperor and in favor of his son. Fouché had dispatched throughout all France agents devoted to himself, who, under the pretext of hostility to the Bourbons, were actually working for the restoration of the Republic and against the Emperor. The least evil consequence of the expectations he thus sought to excite was the preparing of men's minds to some new political scenes. It necessarily followed that free scope was given to malevolent representations because whatever rendered the emperor unpopular served the designs of Fouché. There was, consequently, much delay in recruiting the army. The police made no efforts to rouse the public spirit, but did more than enough to stifle it. Everything was said and encouraged to be said against the House of Bourbon because that served the minister's plans. The time passed away, and the ranks of our battalion still remained thin. The emperor received advices from Germany that the Russian and Austrian forces would not be prepared to commence operations on the French frontier before the beginning of July. This is not the case, however, with regard to the English and Prussian armies, which already presented a menacing attitude in Belgium. Chapter 3. It was now the end of May. The deputies from the departments, both for the Champ de May and the legislative body, had arrived at Paris. The holding of that numerous assembly was delayed until the votes on the emperor's re-election could be collected. That business was tedious and was not terminated before the latter end of May. The holding of the Champ de May, therefore, did not take place until the 3rd of June. The commencement of another epoch in our history, not less brilliant than those which had preceded it, seemed to be announced by that day. The immense space included between the peristyle of the Tuileries and that of the military school was filled by a prodigious crowd passing along the great avenue of the Champs-Élysées to the bridge of Yenna and thence across the champs de mars The multitude was beyond all calculation and the terraces around the champs de mars were as crowded as ever they had been on any of the greatest festivals of the revolution. The retinue by which the emperor was accompanied was as splendid as it used formerly to be on the celebration of important ceremonies. The immense multitude through which he passed welcomed him with cheers and assuredly had not the prospect of war checked the hope in which the public wished to indulge, nothing would have been wanting to complete that happiness which all appeared to derive from this extraordinary event. All the details of this assembly were carefully prepared, and everything was done to impress upon it a grand character of freedom. Deputations attended it from every part of France, and never was there an occasion on which all the elements of the power and all the branches of the administration of the country were taught to speak at once so intelligibly. To the eye and to the understanding, the emperor was in his robe of ceremony. It was observed with some reason that he would have done better had he retained his ordinary dress, which was military uniform, though he was usually robed when he took part in ceremonies of the nature of the present. He arrived at Champ de Mar in a state coach, accompanied by all the marshals on horseback. The whole of the National Guard of Paris and a considerable number of other troops were under arms. The procession came along the Brigiana and proceeding by a circuit purposely made, drew up in the first court of the military school after the persons who occupied the carriages had alighted in the peristyle of that edifice. At the first floor windows of the middle front of the military school, a balcony was erected. Stairs were constructed, which led by an easy descent from the balcony into the semicircular enclosure facing it, within which were the seats appropriated to the 10 or 12,000 deputies who composed the assembly of the Champ de May. The persons who came in the train of the emperor assembled in the rooms of the first story of the military school. Then they proceeded into the balcony, which was on the level with the floor of the apartments. Everyone took the station previously assigned to him, and the emperor, who was in the rear of the procession, seated himself in a chair prepared for his reception. After some preliminary ceremonies, the arch-chancellor... Advancing to the middle of the balcony, read in the faces of the assembly the minutes of the scrutiny of the votes taken in the communes for the re-election of the emperor to the imperial dignity, and declared that the number of votes in the affirmative exceeded by a million those in the negative. Thus did the emperor again become the head of the nation, and his election can neither be attributed to foreign bayonets nor to the votes of communes given in the midst of hostile armies. It cannot be pretended that a substitute was found in the influence 
influence of military menaces for at that time the troops were either already assembled upon or on their march to the frontier so that the means of violating the freedom of election were in no way possessed by the government it will doubtless be remarked by some that france having a king had no right to elect another chief upon this point i shall confine myself to a single reflection the question would otherwise carry me too far. In the month of April 1814, the Senate, which was assembled in the midst of hostile armies, pronounced the deposition of the emperor at the very time when he was at the head of the National Army at Fontainebleau. That assembly then delivered France up to the foreign sovereigns, who were at least guided by a policy inimical to our power, if they were not, besides, influenced by Frenchmen who had abandoned their country in honor. Such shall a proceeding called the national act what commune voted for the deposition of the emperor and the recall of the king what article of the constitution authorized the senate to annul an act fortified by the individual assent of nearly 30 millions of citizens who had invested the emperor with supreme power which is the more national and consequently the more legal of these two acts but the emperor had abdicated. He certainly had. But when and how? Abdication is, besides the case provided for by the law. The Constitution had determined who should be the heir to the throne. Had a sufficient motive existed for setting aside that heir, then ought the nation to have been consulted with regard to the choice of a successor to the crown, otherwise to subvert again all interests and to put an end to all legal order. Nothing more would be wanting than a second invasion, and that an enemy army should collect together a few wretched outcasts from all parties. But even upon the supposition, the emperor had a better right than any other person to the throne inasmuch as he had just conquered France with his 600 men and without firing a single shot. In vain will it be pretended that advantage was taken of the astonishment of the communes to carry the election by surprise. The emperor was too well known to allow of his election being an affair of surprise. Besides, in submitting himself to the decision of a ballot, he afforded every individual time for reflection and sufficient leisure to consider whether he ought to reject or choose him. It was not therefore surprise, but renewal of affection of which this election gave proof. On the contrary, in the act of forfeiture pronounced by the Senate, there is evidence both of surprise and constraint. So certainly was this the case that not one senator could be found who did not, in his individual capacity, regret what he had done. Besides, if the act of forfeiture was valid, why was the emperor asked to abdicate? But if that act of forfeiture was exhorted at the same time that it was beyond the competency of the Senate, what becomes of the abdication of the emperor, even supposing it unconnected with all the circumstances by which it was accompanied? As the abdication was not in favor of the son, it was void. Or if not, then all the abdications of Bayon would be valid, as the Spanish throne then wanted heirs as little as that of France. When the emperor was forced to abdicate, the public, it is said, could no longer endure to see the fortune of the country continually compromised. Was that a reason for throwing all away at once? It was wished to see an end to the revolution, but is a new subversion of all the interests of the country the way to close the revolution? It was necessary to revert to the legitimate princes. Very good. Yes, this sudden want of legitimacy was the cause of many illegitimate acts. Besides, in what species of legitimacy was the emperor wanting? The general admiration had decreed him the crown. Victory had restored it to him, and he would not resume it without the national assent, without the assent of the whole people expressed by every citizen individually and with full freedom. A series of brilliant successes seemed to have firmly settled it upon his head when a great reverse suddenly loosened all the ties of political sympathy and affection and substituted neglect and desertion for those sentiments of grateful attachment which but a short time before seemed imperishable. An effort of courage, unexampled in ancient or modern times, restored him to that power which he had been asked to abandon for the benefit of the nation. And the first use he made of it was to leave to every individual the liberty of re-electing him or not by allowing full time for reflection to correct the effect of the admiration excited by his bold enterprise. He now received this assembly of the Champ de May, the manifestation of the esteem and confidence 
with which France again entrusted him to the care of her destiny. After the emperor had been, for the second time, proclaimed head of the government, he addressed the assembly in a discourse that was energetic and noble. In the course of his speech, he replied to the declaration of the 13th of March, in which the Allied sovereigns stated that it was against him alone that they waged war, and that it was solely to divest him of power that they had again united their efforts. The emperor told the assembly that he would willingly sacrifice his existence if he were assured that that was the sole cause of the resentment of their enemies. But he advised them not to be deceived by such pretenses, informed them that the real object of the new armament of the Allies was to obtain possession of our fortresses and the dismemberment of some of the fairest provinces of our territory by the partition of which they hoped to smooth the differences which, in spite of their coalition, still existed amongst them. In conclusion, he remarked that the danger was great and strongly enforced the conviction that a nation loses everything when it loses its independence. These observations appeared to make a deep impression upon the assembly, and nothing seemed to indicate that he, to whose hands the reins of government were now, for the second time committed, would so soon be abandoned. Having finished this speech, the emperor stepped into the middle of the Champ de Mar, where he caused to be assembled all the officers of every rank belonging to the National Guard and the other troops which were in Paris and addressed them in a similar bold and energetic manner. The cries of Vive la Brewer filled the air. If at any time enthusiasm might be relied on, was there ever an occasion at which more was manifested than on this? The scene which this day presented will never be effaced from the memory of those who witnessed it, and no one could fail to remark that never did the French people at any period of the revolution seem more disposed to defend their liberty and their independence. The emperor himself left the Champ de Mars confident that he might rely on the sentiments then manifested towards him. And from that moment, his only care was to prepare to meet the storm which was forming in Berlin, Belgium.